Hello everyone, my name is Ralph Carter. I'm the Chief Network Solutions Architect within CDI. And just a quick note about CDI, we are a hybrid IT solutions provider specializing in the software-defined WAN and data center space. If you or your organization is looking for more information about Cisco ACI, uh, designing uh, Cisco ACI for network segmentation or uh, have micro-segmentation initiatives or how your organization can benefit from a Cisco ACI-enabled data center, uh, please contact us below uh, under my signature at www.cdilc.com. Now, for today, I'm going to go over some of the common Cisco ACI logical constructs that you should know when designing and building out your application-centric policy models. As you know, uh, Cisco ACI is designed around the application in mind, focusing on an application service delivery data center where the application is accessible in the most secure, agile, reliable, and operationally efficient manner. Now, we as network architects need to remember that you don't design the application for the network. You design the network for the application because businesses rely on applications in order to prosper. And all they care about is making sure that their applications continue to be a service and more importantly, an uninterruptible service. But with traditional network architectures and their inherent limitations. It's difficult to enforce security, among other things, which can force the application to be unavailable, right? So let's take a look at how you can actually model an application in Cisco ACI and explain the, the different logical constructs and how you can actually effectively add network security to an application, as well as streamline, you know, application-centric implementation within a data center. So to better understand how this all relates, we would need to have a clear understanding of the application in question. And what I'm depicting here is not an application um, that is you know, solely virtualized, but an application that has the web and app tiers inside a virtual environment and the database tier on, uh, on bare metal physical hosts, right? And the reason I'm showing you this is because Cisco ACI doesn't care, right? ACI only cares about the application. And to ACI, the application consists of the virtual machines, the physical servers, the IP addressing, the security rules, the load balancers, et cetera, et cetera. Basically, everything that makes up the application, which allows the application to be a service. So... In ACI, we start off with creating a tenant, which is a logical container representing the policy owner in the virtual fabric. Within the tenant, we would create one or more layer three contexts or VRFs, virtual routing and forwarding instances. And we can have you know, one for production, one for dev, one for QA, one for DMZ, et cetera, et cetera. It's all gonna depend on you know, your design and there are a lot of designs you can have. You know, with the most current version of Cisco ACI, uh, I believe you can deploy up to 32 VRFs in a single tenant and you could have hundreds of tenants. After we uh, define the VRF, we can start creating the application network profiles. And in this case, I have my three tier application one profile. And within that profile, you create your EPGs or endpoint groups. And these are basically a grouping of common services that make up the application, such as in the case, um, in this case, an EPG for web, uh, an EPG for app, and an EPG for database. What we can do here is classify our endpoints through various ways, such as based on IP address, based on subnet, based on VLAN, physical port, maybe even VM attribute, right? Um, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a couple of different ways, um, you know, with, with the, the goal of grouping uh, common components together so that they apply, uh, so they can actually apply any given policy as a group versus um, individually. We also have something called a bridge domain where each EPG in this particular case is tied to. And the bridge domain actually represents a layer two forwarding construct. Okay, but you needed part of this logical model. And I hope this, representation, uh, this present representation is not too misleading because you can have a single bridge domain with multiple EPGs as well, right? But the, 
the, the reason for this particular design where I'm tying in the endpoint group to each bridge domain is so I have flexibility with layer four through seven service insertion, which I'm gonna to touch on in a little bit. We also, have, um, also define our subnets on the actual bridge domain, which is a common configuration if you wanna leverage the ACI fabric as a layer three fabric. And this gateway address becomes the default gateway for the web EPG in this particular case. You can also define multiple subnets and default gateways under each bridge domain. I mean, but then again, it's, it's, it's whatever your design dictates. Because ACI is based on a zero trust model, these EPGs have no communications between each other by default. Um, so you need to create something called a contract, which is which can be considered a glorified access list, but we're not creating access lists based on traditional five tuple, you know, where we define the, the source and destination IP, the source and destination port and protocol. But in ACI, we define the EPGs in place of the source and destination IP addresses. And we configure something called a filter within the contract, which represents the ports and protocols allowed between the endpoint groups. So effectively with this approach alone, you can harden your applications within the data center and only allow the communication that's allowed. As I mentioned before, Cisco ACI allows us that capability of layer four through seven insertion. And what this actually means is that we can redirect traffic between endpoint groups to a firewall or a load balancer or chain the actual redirection so traffic goes through a load balancer first and then through a firewall. Very, very powerful stuff. And the question I would ask is, how would you be able to achieve this in the real world with traditional architectures where you can selectively stick a hardware or virtual firewall in the path of any given application, right? You would have to do 20 different things to make that happen. And sometimes it's not really viable. But Cisco ACI radically simplifies this whole service insertion process. So now that you know, we have our application model defined and, and we bound our virtual and bare metal services to the application, we need to uh, be able to allow external connectivity. And we do that through something called a layer three out. Think of the layer three out as a routing process where you define different, in, uh, different interface profiles for connecting to different devices. And I can configure my layer three out for BGP, for OSPF, EIGRP, static routing, pretty much all the common protocols. Under this layer three out, you would also define external EPGs, right? External endpoint groups, because they also need contracts between the internal application EPGs so that the internal application can be available to outside uh, consumers, right? Be available outside the ACI fabric. And in this particular example, I would configure a contract between the web and the outside EPG and leave the other EPGs isolated for security reasons or create separate hardened contracts um, you know, from only for only management traffic such as SSH. Now, if you have a legacy data center or a switching environment that you need to connect to for possible migration reasons or, you know, extending to a separate firewall or router, um, you can easily achieve this uh, in two different ways, right? So one being an EPG extension and the other through a, something called a layer two out, right? So we have a layer three out and now we have a layer two out. Typically, in my experience, um, I primarily used EPG extensions as a form of connecting external devices and networks. Layer two out is really only viable when you need to apply a contract to the external layer two device. So, you know, there are different use cases, but uh, I've, I've used the uh, EPG extensions more often. So in short, these are, you know, more of the common logical constructs that you need to be aware of, right? There are other things that could be factored in, such as subjects and contracts or labels and different configurations for layer four through seven insertion. But, you know, we can definitely cover those um, in another video. So in closing, you know, I hope that this was uh, educational. And again, if you are looking for more information or a proof of concept on Cisco ACI, uh, please reach out to us at www.cdilc.com. Thank you.